And joining us now on the debate for the full hour, Arlene King, Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Carol Morley, Director of the Board at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, Douglas Manuel, Senior Scientist at the Ottawa Health Research Institute, David Sparling, Chair of Agri-Food Innovation and Regulation at Western's Richard Ivey School of Business, and Anne Emanuel Byrne, Canada Research Chair in International Health at the University of Toronto's Dalla Lana School of Public Health. Hello to you all. Hi. Okay, we have a lot to talk about, but I want to start with sort of setting the table. Arlene, what are we talking about when we're talking about preventative health? Well, there's a number of different aspects of it. First of all, it's trying to prevent disease or injury to begin with. Some people also think about early detection of disease as well. That's another type of prevention that we call secondary prevention. But I think even more importantly, it's sort of a new frontier of prevention, which is preventing the precursors of disease. So what we call primordial prevention. So preventing those conditions that actually lead to the development of risk factors for disease. Douglas, is that how you see it? I, I would I'd agree with everything, yeah. Anyone want to add anything to that definition as we move on? I, I agree. I think it's also a matter of, uh, from a patient perspective, uh, becoming more proactive in what they're doing with uh, their lifestyle, whether it's diet, uh, sleep hygiene, um, exercise, etc. So Doug, how does this differ, preventative uh, health, how does it differ from illness care, the more traditional approach? Well, I think first one point about the preventive medicine, I think there is one, there are differences around the world in how we think about it. I think Canada, one distinguishing feature is that we think of preventive medicine also at the population level, not just the individual level. Uh, so in, if you uh, go to medical school in the States and you become a preventive, you may become a preventive medicine doctor in the States, that's more clinically focused. Here in Canada, it would be <coughs> uh, almost entirely sort of more population or community focused. So I think that's a, a big distinguishing feature um, from, from that disease um, and from, from the preventive. So th that clinical side and the preventive side. But it's not just about the medical system. It really is about the entire uh, population and um, all the things that we do to actually stay healthier. And, and so one of the ones that's really come out of we were understanding a whole lot more about lately is the whole area of food and health and our relationship that the impact of our diet on our health on our population health and ultimately on our health care system um, and that's one of the things that I think um, we don't spend enough time and effort looking at and there's quite a bit that we can do in that area. Well you work with food companies <clears throat> how do they see preventative health? Um, they see it from a couple different dimensions. Uh, one, they see that there's a lot that they can do with food um, in terms of adding ingredients that are healthy, fortifying foods. So from that perspective, they think oh, as an industry, there are things that they can do. They also recognize that as an industry, there's a lot that they haven't been doing right over the years. You look at the levels of salt, you look at the levels of fats, sugars, trans fats. Um, and so the industry recognizes it has a responsibility to change um, and is actually interested in finding ways to do that, recognizing also that they still are in business. And so if they move too far ahead of um, their customers and their consumers in terms of salt reduction, people will actually just stop buying their products. We're going to talk more about that okay. in a bit, but I want to get back to something I think you mentioned, Doug, which is a preventative health doctor. What, what is that? A preventative health doctor, in, mostly in other countries, would be the ones that, uh, that clinicians, primary care clinicians, may refer to uh, for difficult cases of prevention. They see someone at high risk, they're not sure what to do, they may refer, uh, uh, refer the doctor, refer the patient to that doctor, or they may be the ones that um, uh, focus on things like preventive guidelines. Um, so in Canada, we don't have that as much. Um, in Canada, um, our primary care physicians, our primary care other clinicians, and like naturopaths or, uh, or dietitians would be the ones kind of leading, uh, leading the role in that individual clinical prevention. Arlene, I know you want to jump in here, but I just want to ask Anne Emanuel. I would actually take a step, step back and say we need to look at prevention as the constellation of societal factors, including social policies, regulation, and the steps, the actions that uh, we take collectively and personally to reduce uh, illness, delay disability, or avoid di a disability, and prevent premature death. I think we need to think of all of these things together. 
Arlene. So in fact, the Public Health Agency of Canada talks about four faces of prevention, and I think it's important that we remember, we remember all of those four faces, one of which is the clinical prevention, which is the one-on-one -on -one counseling and, and other things that we do to keep people healthy, like vaccinate them, for instance. And then there's also health promotion, which relates to social marketing strategies to try to keep people healthy. Regulations, so health protections or regulations that we put in place in order to prevent illness. And finally, and I think most importantly, and that's the point you're making, is the whole issue of healthy public policies, which are the things that are outside of the health sector that actually enable us to, to lead healthy and, and productive lives. Well, let me ask you this, given that your explanation of what preventative health really means, it's, it's, it has many facets. It hasn't mm -hmm. become that we, uh, generally when we talk about health care, it's come to mean hospitals and medication. Yeah, and I think that, first of all, when Medicare was first introduced by Tommy Douglas, he realized that that was actually the first phase of the introduction of Medicare, and in fact that we had to stop just patching people up, but actually started, start making them healthy to begin with. And so I think that it's a matter of shifting the public understanding of, uh, from health care to health in general. I think that's where naturopathic medicine has a, could have an amazing role in today's healthcare system. Um, because I think that's what we truly do. Um, as a naturopathic doctor, I see many people, um, maybe they have a huge family history of diabetes, for example, and um, they don't want to go down that route. So maybe their parents, their grandparents have diabetes or heart disease, and they'll come to me and say, I don't want to go down that road. What can I do from a diet perspective, um, from maybe a supplement perspective, uh, lifestyle perspective, so I, I don't follow in their, footsteps, in their footsteps. Anna Manuel, the reality is, I mean, when we turn on even medical shows on television, we're seeing you know, hospitals, doctors, ambulances, why no preventative uh, health aspects to, to our medical system as we see it? Well, first of all, it's uh, very difficult to measure uh, uh, an epidemic that doesn't happen, right? Or uh, even the likelihood of lowering the likelihood of getting a particular ailment. So one of the questions is perceptual. But I think also we're looking at health in very individual and personal terms. And we need to look more at the population at the societal level and look at different societies. So why is it that uh, Spain has a longer life expectancy than Canada? Why is it that a country with a low per capita income like Costa Rica uh, has uh, almost as long a life expectancy as the United States? And so if we look at the range of public policies that societies are investing in, whether it's eliminating their military in the case of Costa Rica and heavily in, uh, investing in uh, nutrition, housing, social well-being, uh, or whether it's reducing child poverty, as is the case in many European countries, I think we need to use those as a lens on prevention. We're going to talk about childhood poverty and how it relates to health and stuff, but I want to take a very concrete example right now. Let's look at obesity. When we talk about obesity, we know we have a problem in Canada and, and around the developed world for sure, and in most of the world, but how does a, a preventative approach, Doug, how does it change how we deal with obesity? Well, let's, I, I mean, maybe touching on your last question as well, if you look at diabetes, we, uh, we had one study where we, we first said how many people are going to develop diabetes in Ontario but over the next 10 years, and then said how could we reduce it uh, by 10%. And looked at different strategies. So, uh, so I'll put a question in your mind that'll answer it. Uh, what weight reduction do you think you'd need for the entire population to reduce 10 percent of diabetes? And then the second question would be: If we went to the clinic and we gave people medications that are shown to be effective, uh, how many people would we need to have on, continually on those medications to reduce diabetes by 10 percent? So, first question: three percent. 3% weight, weight loss, in uh, average weight loss in Ontario to reduce new cases of diabetes by 10%. Answer the second question, 750,000 Ontarians on medications to prevent 10% 10, 10 of cases that are going to develop. So, you know, when we took that to the policy actors, we sort of said, like, 750,000, we don't, how can we go to the family docs and primary care, primary care clinicians and, and ask them to, to put another you know, work with so many people and have so many people on medications. At the same time, you sort of say 3%, you know, can't we, can't we achieve that? But so, so these, these um, weight, weight's huge, hugely important, uh, and just even small changes can make a big change in those diseases, diseases downstream. 
Arlene, you're the head doctor of this province. How do you go to the other doctors and say, we need to accomplish this? What's the preventative health approach to, to, reducing, di uh, to reducing obesity? Well, again, this is one of our wicked problems, and uh, we require all of the different application of all the different faces of prevention that I've talked about. So the involvement and engagement of, of obviously the health sector, but also we need all of government approaches to deal with this. So all government departments need to make prevention of diabetes, reduction of obesity uh, a, a priority, and there needs to be engagement of the private sector as well. So sectors outside of government and also non-governmental organizations. But a survey that was released today actually, an Ipsos Reid survey that was conducted by the Heart and Stroke Foundation that said that 85% of Ontarians believe that government should spend more on prevention. So I think that we need to think hard about what that actually means in terms of where we're going to get the most bang for our buck in terms of trying to deal with wicked problems like obesity, for instance. The, the whole problem of money, though, is a, real, is a real challenge because right now the province spends close to $48 billion on health care and about $400 million on the Ministry of Health Promotion. So 1% of the money goes to prevention um, and the rest goes to health care. And, and that's partly a political problem because as a politician, you're measured on what you do during your term. And if you invest in prevention, you're actually investing in a population that's healthier in 10, 15, 20 years. And so uh, that's a <clears throat> we need to take that out of being such a political uh, decision to this is what we need to do as a population to be successful. And then you need to say, well, what are all the pieces of the system that will affect obesity? So um, food is a huge one. And, and it's interesting that when I talk to food companies, they're very aware that this is partly their responsibility and that this is going to be the major driver of change over the next few years, food and health. Um, but but then we also have to look at what are we doing about activity? What are we doing about teaching people how to cook? It's interesting to, to listen to chefs talk about, well, kids don't really know how to cook. And if you don't know how to cook properly, then you don't know how to cook in ways that reduce well, let me, fat. Let me push back a little bit there. Sure. Because if, if that's what you're hearing <clears throat> from food companies, that yeah. kids don't know how to cook, they're giving us all this prepackaged, easy to cook food. So, I mean, people are blaming the food industry at large uh, about Canada's obesity problem. What do you say to that? Uh, I think there, there are two things. One, I mean, it's, it's what we produce and it's what you can, you know, what we as individuals consume. So. Um, part of us loves to consume sweet fat stuff and, and that's probably not going to change so if we can educate people about how you can have some of that but as long as you have the right activity levels then, um, then you can maintain a healthy weight then that's one piece of it. From a food company's perspective it's about how can I give those treats in either smaller doses with lower levels of fat um, and so we're actually seeing things called stealthy reductions where food companies are not advertising that they're taking fat and sugar out of their products they're just doing it because they really don't want to draw attention to the fact that you know it's probably not the healthiest product you're eating anyways and so they actually trim things down I think that's the one of the things that you said mm. here is the key what's the root cause and the root cause what I'm seeing you know clinically is people don't know how to cook they don't like to cook so from my perspective it's about giving people the tools so um, you know when we talk about education as prevention so maybe taking a look at you know going into the schools and I don't even know if high schools these days have um, you know a home economics class uh, but having you know cooking segments um, you know and maybe those kids are gonna start to go home and show the parents like mom dad I want to make a chicken stir fry tonight uh, something healthier or um, getting back to a family level and um, seeing making time for those family meals we've really moved away from that I think in in today's society because we're so busy so getting back down to the basics and um, cherishing family time eating together cooking at home eating out less uh, those kind of things I think that's really is that reasonable? I mean, is a health, does a healthier society really mean, by what you're saying, means a slower society? I, I do. I really, I think it is reasonable. I think people just need those tools. Yeah. People are so lost because we are so busy. We're tied to our blackberries. We're, you know, rushing from here to there, picking up the kids, throwing in a laundry and everything. But I think if we take a step back and we actually make the time and use our time wisely on the weekends, preparing meals for the week, you know, um, making a big bowl of, uh, or a big pot of soup, uh, lentil soup or something, getting back down to the basics. But the reality is that yeah. as consumers, as consumers, 
we don't change easily and and a lot of people are not going to change their lifestyle and so there is an important role for the food industry to actually make easy convenient products that are still very healthy and we're seeing we're definitely seeing some of those coming on screen. I mean, where do you stand on this? Well and I think there's also again <clears throat> going back to the four faces of prevention a role for regulation as well which does in fact enable innovation to occur mm -hmm. within the food industry and a couple of I think innovative strategies that have been put in place in, in the regulatory and policy spheres are uh, a reduction in trans fats in schools which has been mandated by the province of Ontario um, as well as um, policies to ensure that there are healthy food and beverages in schools and that will be put in place mm -hmm. in September of this year. So I think these kinds of policies and regulations again are important complementary activities to the kinds of things you're describing for instance in terms of education of the consumer and uh, and of, of children as well. Is she right though, is Carol right though when she suggests that we need to slow down in order to become healthier, to make more time to, to, to have a healthier lifestyle? Well, I think the, the challenge we have is that, um, you know, we're all very busy people. And uh, I think uh, you see that particularly in uh, lower socioeconomic groups in particular who are more disadvantaged uh, to, uh, to enable to be able to take on those kinds of approaches and why we have growing health inequities as well. So uh, I think we need to have a balance of the educational approaches with those other ways of trying to prevent disease. And injury. Okay, Carol, Arlene says yeah. you have to have the resources in it to be able to slow down. Not everyone can do it. Now, I think that there's little things that people can take. So if you're looking at a lower socioeconomic um, a family, um, maybe that means on the weekends, instead of uh, sitting around together watching a movie, instead you're going grabbing the bikes from the garage or whatever, and you're going for a bike ride as a family. So you're doing some fitness. Um, or maybe that means uh, taking a little group trip, a family trip to the grocery store and understanding, so the kids understand where, what fruits and vegetables are and then making a meal together. I want to agree and somewhat disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I want to agree with the idea that when, when you poll people and, they, and, they, um, and you ask them what are their challenges around being healthy, uh, number one is time, um, time use. Uh, so I agree, I agree with that, the idea that the pressures um, uh, of, of time and how, how it would be really helpful to be able to slow down. Where I'm reluctant to, where I'm a little bit reluctant is, is the idea that um, uh, putting a lot on the individual, uh, so much on the individuals. I think, importantly, people haven't changed. The world around them has. So people for the last 30 years have been really interested in, in being healthy, and I think it's more so now than it ever has been. But it's really difficult to send your kids to school with a healthy, healthy lunch. In, 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 you know, I go to the grocery store, and there are there's not healthy children's cereals. It's just, I think it's as simple as that. And you know, when I grew up, I grew up in Halifax. We had two McDonald's, one in Halifax and one in Dartmouth, and we would go maybe once a year as that birthday treat. You know, and then my kids growing up now, you know, there's fast food throughout the Everywhere. neighborhood. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is more difficult today to live a healthy lifestyle, in my, in my opinion, than it did was 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. And I think that's, that's the biggest problem. And Emmanuel, you look at international, uh, different countries and stuff like this, a uniquely Canadian phenomenon? No, it certainly isn't. In fact, obesity rates have been growing across the world, but they're particularly strong in North America. And there's a very interesting case uh, in Mexico. When I was in graduate school, which wasn't that long ago, the leading cause of death uh, in Mexico was malnutrition-related infant mortality. Today, the leading cause of death is diabetes. What happened in the interim? The North American Free Trade Agreement which allowed uh, subsidized, high-processed uh, uh, U.S. and Canadian foods to enter the Mexican market, squeezed Mexican corn producers out of business, and made the cost per calorie of junk food uh, much lower than that of the uh, local diet, which in many ways is nutritionally perfect, right? The Aztec diet of uh, rice, beans, uh, corn tortillas, lime, and so on. 
So I think we really need to look not only at the behavioral, cultural, household, and even at uh, the sort of provincial and state uh, regulatory aspects, but at production and global trade, which have become huge elements in this growing, growing epidemic. I, I think we don't have to look outside of, of Canada as well for some of these challenges that we face. We look at our Aboriginal populations in the north. They have very, very high rates of diabetes and the consequences of diabetes. And a lot of that relates to the absence of these enablers that you're talking about. So uh, milk, I was recently up in, in our north and, you know, milk in some of our isolated First Nations communities is, you know, $10 for two liters of milk and, you know, $6 for four apples of nebulous quality. Mm -hmm. So these enabling factors are simply not there. And, uh, you know, it's no small wonder that we have got exorbitant rates of high, high you know, high rates of diabetes in our northern Aboriginal populations, for instance. I actually want to bring up some statistics talking about diabetes in Canada. Let's bring this up. Take a look at this. Two million uh, Canadians were living with diagnosed diabetes. This comes from uh, 2000 and 2007 uh, from the Public Health Agency of Canada. And Canadian adults with diabetes are twice as likely to die prematurely. So we know that diabetes is a big problem in the Aboriginal community, in the broader community as well. As well. So what does a greater emphasis on a preventative approach to diabetes look like? Carol, why don't you start us off? Uh, I think a preventative approach to diabetes looks at um, exercise, number one, because exercise can make those insulin receptors more sensitive. Uh, so exercise, uh, taking a look at food and really educating the public not only on um, sugar, but what a healthy diet looks like overall. You know, so what does that look like? Does that look like protein in every meal? Um, what kind of healthy snacks are out there? Um, yeah, so I think the diet and the, and the exercise. And Emmanuel? I would argue that we need to look at uh, production subsidies in the agro sector, certainly. Uh, we would also might want to think about uh, taxing uh, the most unhealthy foods. I mean, wh why shouldn't we have incentives for tax incentives for eating fruits and vegetables uh, rather than subsidies for uh, high processed foods? I would also argue that we need uh, urban and rural environments that are more conducive to exercise uh, rather than to automobile transport. I mean, there are many parts of this country where it's impossible to go out and take a bike. It's too dangerous. So I think we need to look at those range of policies that would actually uh, encourage the kinds of things that you're talking about. And then ultimately, uh, reducing poverty and inequality would enable folks to actually make the kinds of choices, family choices, individual and behavioral choices, that folks who are better off can do uh, because they have more, more free time and more, more income and so okay, on. Okay, we're going to talk about possible tax incentives, but I want to talk a little bit now about Maybe a success story. Let's take a look at some smoking rates here in Canada. Mm -hmm. This uh, is about Canadians over 15 years old. So from 1999 to 2009, so in a decade, the smoking rates dropped from 25% to 18%. Okay, Arlene, we seem to have had success uh, with smoking. I mean, is, that, is this the case, the success case for uh, preventative care to deal with other problems. We yes, have. it is. I think this is a really good example of where a multi-sectoral, all of government approaches have actually worked to continue to work to try to affect the prevalence of smoking. And I'll give you an example, and people don't think of it, but uh, you know, the Department of Finance Ministries of Finance, Revenue have significant roles to play, for instance, with respect to taxation policies, uh, with respect to managing contraband tobacco, as an example. The Ministry of Education, with respect to education of our youth, in trying to implement youth prevention programs. Uh, all of government approaches have been very, very successful, and again, engagement of the private sector, engagement of non-governmental organizations, and the public, ultimately, who, you know, again, believe as part of this, again, recent poll done today, uh, that we should do even more to try to continue to reduce the uh, youth uptake in particular uh, of smoking. So it is a success story. However, I would like to say that we need to continue to be aggressive about it because 
I think there's a lot of people, tobacco is out of mind, that it's no longer a problem anymore. And yet we still have 18% of our population who are smoking approximately, and 13,000 preventable deaths per year, that's one every 40 minutes, due to tobacco. Uh, that's not acceptable, and we need to continue to war on tobacco through this multifaceted approach that we're talking about. Doug, is the smoking success story, if you will, is that the template that we should be using for other problems, diabetes, things like that, as you see it? It's a great starting point. I think that when you talk with people internationally, uh, you have kind of two camps that say, lots of lessons to learn from smoking, no lessons to learn from smoking when we go to diabetes. But I think it's important to point out, too, when, when um, Ontario's success in smoking, I. I was caught off guard a bit when we wrote a report and I was calling my colleagues around the world and, so, and we were asked to benchmark Ontario to other jurisdictions about just he healthy living. And uh, often got the comment like, why are you, why are you calling us? We, we, we think that Ontario's uh, a leader for smoking. So I, I think there was some serious success that happened in Ontario around smoking. And I do think that there are lessons to be learned. Um, and I, I do agree with Arlene that one of the lessons is is that for smoking it wasn't one thing, it was a hundred things. And that for, for um, obesity, it's going to be a hundred to a thousand things. See, that's, that's the thing. Smoking, you're dealing with one product, and if you can influence demand for that one product, then you can have a significant change. Um, you know, you talk about taxes, so we tax soda pop, but what do we do about ice cream? What do we do about fast food? So there's a, there, and we start taxing all of those. Um, it gets very complicated, and those taxes have to be high. The studies seem to show that you need to tax um, pop 18% or something like that in order to actually influence the demand at all. Um, and, you know, how much that's going to affect the ultimate diabetes rate, I'm not sure. I think it's one of the tools you can look at, but I actually think there are probably lots of better ways to, to make it. One of the things we've done is looked at what's the impact of dietitians. So information is really important for people. And uh, so we did a study at Ivy looking at the relationship between obesity and, and dietitians and found that you know a 1% increase in, in uh, di the population of dietitians actually could reduce obesity rates by about 0.3%. That's huge in terms of numbers. Okay, you raise taxing junk food. Let's go there. I'm going to bring sure. up another quotation. This comes from uh, The Guardian, the UK uh, newspaper. Here's what it says. Common ingredients in fast food, ready meals, and drinks should be taxed as a public health measure to curb soaring rates of obesity and diabetes, according to a leading epidemiologist. Rather than targeting junk food in general, the tax would be applied to salt, alcohol, sugar, and saturated fats, the four major ingredients that contribute most to public health problems. The tax would not apply to the ingredients sold separately. Doug, good idea. Let's tax these things. Uh, well couple points. One is that as, as far as we were, we were ahead for smoking. We're behind for these sorts of policies. So note that they're being discussed uh, outside the country, that there are countries that bring in on, on, on junk food tax. You know, New York City has, has done food labeling uh, in restaurants. Ontario is behind. So I think it's great that we're having, that you put that and that we're having the discussion. I would, I would definitely not take, take taxes off the table. Um, and I think it would be a a great, great thing to debate, including in this sort of forum. Um, I, I, I also think that uh, uh, we have legislation, or we have a, we have a, um, on, on the, you're on the floor right now, a proposal to label food um, in restaurants. And when I talk to people, hardly anyone knows about it. And it's going to go off now. Uh, you know, there's going to be a recess. It's going to be off. So, even beyond taxation. I think that there is some policy that we can use uh, to be a leader that's sitting, you know, that's being discussed, that's sitting actually on on the floor right now. That's going to going to be going to be gone, you know, in, in and a week or so. If I could just add, though, that we also have the have to have the healthy choices, both affordable and accessible as well. So you have to have that balance of yes, uh, you know, some of the regulatory approaches that are being described, which I fully agree with, and I think are are probably quite effective in in having some impact. But you also need to complement with that with other policies as well to enable better access to to high quality uh, food choices. Okay, Dave, I know you're going to want to jump in here, but let me yeah. just first go to Anna Manuel. 
I think there are some dangerous uh, victim blaming possibilities if we go the pure uh, taxation route. And one of the lessons from uh, the cigarette smoking campaigns is that they've been mo far more successful among the well-off than the less well-off for a couple of reasons. We know that health education reaches more educated, better off populations, uh, but also uh, smoking is a stress release, right? And folks who are better off have other alternatives to smoking to release their stress, whether it's going to the gym, taking time off, have a having a fantastic vacation, what have you. And I think the worrisome aspect of going uh, along a purely taxing the consumer end as opposed to regulating the producer end uh, is that we will end up further blaming the victim and will continue to have this differential whereby 60, 70 percent of the population will, will reduce their consumption of unhealthy foods and uh, at 18, a 20, a 30 percent of the population will not be able to do that. I mean, it's an interesting systems problem because you have um, a food system that is, that is producing food and they think they're producing what the population wants to consume, and to some extent they are. Um, and you have a population that doesn't always make the right choices. So you have to say, what can we do to actually, A, help them make the right choices and make those right choices easy? And both of those uh, are important. So helping make the right choices, I think education is a big part of that. Um, and also really easy to read labels, easy to read, easy to understand. So that includes, um, you know, Doug's point on restaurant labeling. So you understand what you're actually going to be eating roughly. Um, but it, it also includes understanding what's on those packages. So, so that's one piece. Then the others, how can you make what's in those packages a whole lot healthier? And, and there's some interesting pressures now on companies. Um, the whole corporate social responsibility means that they have to report what they're doing for the public at large. And, and so one of the pressure points on companies is actually, what are you doing to make your products healthier? And you're seeing the impact in companies like Pepsi who are trying to find more juice alternatives and um, have healthier offerings, have reduced ingredient panels and things like that. So there's a lot that has to happen, but it, you have to really think about all the different components. What are the tools that we have that can help me, people make choices better, but also make those good choices easier? You know, the issue of responsibility, who's responsible for our health as individuals is a theme that keeps coming up here. So Carol, let me ask you this. Should more responsibility for our own health be up to you and me and Anne Emanuel and the rest of us instead of sort of blaming the system or the industry? How much responsibility on the individual? I think there should be greater responsibility on the individual. I think the community at large Yes, it, of course it's important, important, government policy, everyone kind of working together as a team um, to help each individual out the best, best way possible. But I think people um, need to take greater responsibility. People need to um, educate themselves. They need to seek out more of that information. Um, granted, we need to have that information from a government perspective, right, or an industry perspective. Uh, so, I think, um, yeah, we, we as an individual definitely need to take more. Doug, is it fair saying it's up to you? I think that there should be uh, individual responsibility. I, I, I think it's really, I think people are having a hard time. Um, and, um, you know, you, um, you, you virtually cannot have, uh, meet your salt, the salt guidelines. Uh, if, you, if you do, you have to do all the cooking in your house. Um, so, you know, ninety percent of people are above 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 uh, salt salt targets. Almost no one has uh, the recommended fruits and vegetables. Um, and I, 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 so I think it's a balance. I think that we people ultimately are responsible for their own lives, but I think people are just having a really hard time. Arlene, you talk to Ontarians. Should it be up to us more and more individually to be taking care of our own health to to, to uh, you know put in the things that we need for a preventative approach? Well, I think individual responsibility is, is ultimately uh, important. However, I do feel that we do need to enable people to be able to make the right choices. How do we do that? Well, again, I think it's through a, a combination of, of different actions, like you know, making sure people are aware of what the, the challenges are, some of the regulatory approaches, and the healthy public policy uh, initiatives that, that I've outlined. And there needs to be a balance of all of those things, because 
I think our overall welfare as a, as a society actually depends on this. I, I can't I, I can't overemphasize the importance of prevention enough because you know this relates to sustainability of our healthcare system. It relates to the sustainability of government writ, writ large. When you look at 46 you know billion dollars out of 46 percent approximately of our provincial budget that's being spent on health care. It's, uh, it, it's absolutely fundamental. And I think, finally, it's not only the right thing to do to, to prevent uh, disease. In, in many instances, it's the only thing we can do. So many of the things that we're trying to prevent, there's no cure for, or there's very ineffective cures for as well. So, you know, we have to make a change here. It's absolutely fundamental. And we need to invest in terms of government and others in what works. And we need to understand what works better. And this is the kind of work that Doug does, is trying to understand what interventions actually make a difference, where we get the most bang for a buck. Okay, but you, start sorry, go ahead. We have to start young. I mean, really, if you're going to make we a do. major societal change like this, we need to invest in, in kids, and we need to help them understand a, what good eating is, and also make it easy. Um, you see some of the fruit and vegetable programs they're doing down in the States and in the UK. S starting getting kids used to eating fruit and vegetables during the day as part of the regular routine isn't something a lot of them e ever experience. And so if you get into those kinds of programs, then you can start to change their behavior. And you change their behavior for their whole life, which will ultimately change their health impact on health costs. But more importantly, it'll change how their lives go for them. Okay, but here's the, here's the problem. The Canadian health system is often criticized for being full of perverse incentives. So. Doctors don't get anything if they don't order tests for their patients. I don't get rewarded for healthy living. So if we take the preventative uh, health care approach, is that going to change? Doug? Uh, I wouldn't rely solely on our, on our clinicians. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in that example I gave for diabetes, if we, even, if, even if we did, we won't, we won't solve the problem. I'm not sure if that answers your question. <laughs> but. If I could just jump in, though, I wanted to talk about an example that's a little closer to home, which is our northern fruit and vegetable yes, exactly. programs in yeah, Ontario yeah, exactly. that hardly anybody's even heard of. Yeah. And we've invested uh, over the last about five years $4 million. We reach about 18,000 kids, um, I think, in over 100 schools with our northern fruit and vegetable programs. And I'm told uh, by the medical officers of health that a lot of the kids have never even seen some of the fruit and vegetables that are mm. offered. And they come to these plates of fruit and vegetables and they sort of swarm around them like bees. And, you know, those kinds of programs are probably not well evaluated. Um, we often just put them in as pilot programs without mm -hmm. rolling them out in a robust way, yeah. uh, you know, across the entire province. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a travesty that it doesn't matter where you go in the province, you pay the same price for alcohol. But when it comes to fruit and vegetables and healthy food choices, there are significant differences across the province. And this is the kind of public policy initiative that we need to complement some of the educational approaches, the regulatory approaches, some of the actions by industry, for instance. Yeah. Okay, but I want to pick away at this perverse incentive idea. Does doing a preventative approach change our system? Do, will, it, will it have to? Arlene. Well, uh, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, incentives are important, absolutely fundamentally. And I think um, industry points that out based on their examples of how you introduce innovation. Um, I think competitiveness, a bit of competitiveness is a good thing. Yeah. And I do agree that incentivizing prevention is going to be important, but it is one element of prevention. And I think that the one lesson we've learned from tobacco is that we need to have a very, very broad-based approach to trying to ensure that we make an impact. And we need to measure it as well. We need to measure our progress. What gets measured gets done. And we don't do that very well either. I think our healthcare system right now, I mean, let's face it, family medical doctors don't have the time to spend with patients on education. You know, they have a limited amount of time. So if we take a look at our healthcare system at large, maybe in a family health care team, uh, family health team setting, where you have, um, you know, a family health team with a medical doctor, a naturopathic doctor, uh, potentially a dietitian, a nurse practitioner. I think all of these different practitioners have potentially uh, a great um, amount to give to, to the patient population. So it's, I think, working together 
um, figuring out what the ba best approach is for the patient. I think that's where we can really uh, move towards prevent prevention. We don't want them to become patients is really the, the well, point, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I want to pick up a point with you, Anna Emanuel. Earlier you mentioned uh, the poverty, and we know that poverty is directly related to poor health. So should we be redistributing uh, more money through taxes to improve public health? Absolutely. Between uh, tax policy, progressive income tax policy, and social transfers, as most European countries carry out, we could do an enormous amount to reduce child poverty and enable this most important determinant of ultimately of health uh, to improve. So I would argue that that's what we need to do first. And if we were to do that, we wouldn't need to worry so much about particular clinical encounters and 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 uh, moments, and we would be able able to uh, reduce the competition between the health sector and the education sector uh, and the agricultural sector and so on. And we would have more resources ultimately so we weren't in this competitive which part of government should be, we be spending our money Where on. Where is this working? You mentioned in Europe. Where specifically is this working? Well, the, probably the most successful case is in France, which has a poverty rate, a uh, child poverty rate, close to what Canada's is. Uh, and after its uh, income tax policies and its uh, social transfers gets down to one of the lowest rates uh, in the world akin to the rates uh, in Scandinavian countries. Good idea, Doug? A pop reducing poverty? Well, not redu through, ta through taxes. Uh, uh, reducing poverty, uh, for sure. Uh, you, you, I don't think you, anyone's going to argue no, that reducing no. poverty is a, a bad uh, thing. Through taxation? Um, sure. I mean, I think that... Uh, uh, I would again. I would take a lot of different, uh, a lot of different approaches. But I think it is important to point out that we can't be the leading health jurisdiction without, without you know, raising those, ra raising all, all the boats and, and raising the, raising the, the, the levels of health for the poorest the most. You will not. It's not. The numbers just don't add up. And Ontario does have a poverty reduction strategy in place with a goal of 25% reduction of poverty. And I think, again, the multifaceted approach to trying to reduce poverty is absolutely fundamental across government departments. One of the, the more recent initiatives uh, as a component of the, po the poverty reduction strategy has been a program, a low-income dental program called Healthy Smiles Ontario. And, you know, I think we often forget that the mouth is part of the human body and trying to <laughs> enable better oral health in order to be able to yes. consume all that good food <laughs> is right. absolutely fundamental as well. So we do have a poverty reduction strategy. We need to stick tenaciously to it and we need to be innovative about trying to implement ways that, uh, that actually will continue the, the trend in the right direction. But okay. it's just one piece of the, the whole thing. Anna Emmanuel um, brought up France and there, there's a very good example in France where one community decided it was going to tackle the issue of childhood obesity and recognize that it was not just, there was no single magic bullet. And so they said, what are we going to do about advertising? What are we going to do about children's exercise programs? What are we going to do about eating in the schools? What are we going to do about helping families eat better at home? All of those pieces together. Um, and they had a dramatic impact on their own population. Now, it was a very focused entire community um, initiative, but it shows that you know if you if you tackle it all and get everybody engaged, you can actually make a big difference. Okay, we have about ten minutes left. I want to bring up one more quotation and then talk a little bit about it. Here it is. This comes up from the medical journal The Lancet. Here's what it says: Is it always true that prevention is better than cure? Consider the example of hypertension. Evidence exists that the benefits of screening and treating substantially outweigh the harms. Yet treatment can be complex and expensive making it difficult for clinicians to carry out the recommended control strategies. Furthermore, treatment for hypertension almost always heightens anxiety and usually needs many consultations and examinations and drugs that patients must take for the rest of their lives, a particularly important issue for young adults with mild hypertension and with no guarantee of individual benefit. I'm guessing if I had five people just like you in here 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we'd be talking about cure and not prevention. So where do we draw the line on prevention? Arlene, I'm going to start with you and go around the table. Well, I would suggest that prevention is always better than a cure. And uh, I think, as I cited earlier, there are many of the diseases that we're trying to prevent right now. There isn't a cure for. And in fact, people die of them. And uh, I mean, as, an, as one example, and there are many, many that I could provide, most of, if not all, of the vaccine-preventable diseases, some of which we've almost eradicated from the face of the earth, 
there's no cure for them. There's no appropriate treatment for them, and there's no appropriate cure for them. So, I mean, I can cite a whole list of examples, but I would suggest that prevention is always better than cure. Doug? Uh, I think it's balanced again. I, I think that, um, well, I, I'm not sure for hypertension we're talking about that for prevention or cure, actually. Uh, but, you know, in Ontario, we're not doing too bad. Um, uh, I think we're probably one of the leading jurisdictions about treatment of, of hypertension. But again, you know, geez, we could, you know, we could save money if we just reduced our salt because we'd have fewer people on hypertensives. Uh, but and as well, our cure system, even though we're, we are constantly, it feels like it's not working for us, all of our, pretty much all of our care measures are, are improving. I get worried about our prevention measures. Obesity is increasing. So I think that we're, we're falling, like when we're, we're not making the progress in prevention like we did in cure. So I think there's a good case for, for a little bit of a shift, you know, or more of a shift towards prevention. But I think it's always a balance. Why would you want to get sick and be cured, <laughs> honestly? Um, and so if you look at something like hypertension, what are all the things that you can do to actually not get sick? And how can society help you um, do those things, which means what can we do to actually make the food that you're eating healthier? What we, can we do to help you understand what foods you can eat? What can we do with some of the new things like plant sterols? And um, we haven't even talked about the advances that we're going to be making in terms of improving what's in crops and what's in food that can actually make you healthier, the whole functional food area. So uh, frankly, I hope I never get sick and have to be cured. I'd much rather have used preventive But I guess approaches. the question, Anna Manuel, is are we putting all our eggs in the prevention basket now? Well, I don't think we are. Obviously, people who are sick need health care, and we should not uh, deny them of, of that health care. But I think the problem in prevention has been it's been too medicalized. And if we think about prevention in larger socio-political terms in these structure, around these structural issues, uh, inequalities, uh, social inequalities, income inequalities, power inequalities, I think we would go much further to getting a big bang out of our prevention buck. So it's going beyond a medical understanding of prevention. But to if a the argument one. is we need a huge societal shift, that this is only going to work if we basically just blow up the societal system, I mean, is that realistic? Well, I don't think we need to blow up the system. No. We can look at uh, local elections, regional elections, and we don't even need to think about the political uh, system necessarily, although it's, an, it, it's, it's a key variable. Communities can play an enormous role in improving lots of these determinants, such as uh, bike lanes, parks, uh, and trying, at least at a community level, to have some kind of redistribution of resources. Yeah, I agree. I don't think we need to blow anything up. I think we have a, a decent base. We just need to come up with more innovative strategies to address all of these concerns. Um, and as far as hypertension, I think, again, it's, it's about that education. Hypertension is a multifactorial disease. You need a multifactorial approach. So, you know, the, the medicine will, will always be there, but uh, we have to look at education as far as exercise, stress management, um, you know, obesity reduction, all, all, of the, all of those arms. We're putting very, very few of our eggs in the prevention basket right now. Absolutely. A very, very Absolutely. small proportion of our eggs in the prevention <clears throat> basket. Right now, within the Ministry of Health, it's about 1% to 2% of our entire budget. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think we need to put this in context. However, that, that being said, I believe it needs to be an evolutionary shift, not a revolutionary shift. So a gradual increase in interventions that work of proven benefit and prevention, and I fully agree with what Doug said, is we really are not doing enough research in determining what is working, and the sickness care system is doing a lot of that work, and the interventions are shifting to ones that actually make more of a difference. So, I mean, I think that's important. We need to not only identify those effective interventions, but we need to actually implement them broadly when we know they work and when we have pilot programs that actually make a difference rather than having them drop off the table we need to implement them broadly as well and we need to learn from many other places as well and I think we're not doing that well enough either. You know we spent about the last hour talking about health and a preventative uh, health approach. Is there a risk here that we're going to get too obsessed? People are already obsessed on their health. We hear it all the time. Is there a risk where, when we say People need to take more responsibility. Government needs to, 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 to do more. Uh, private sector needs to socially market better. I mean, isn't there a risk that we're just all going to get too obsessed about our own health, Carol? Mm. 
I, I don't think so. I don't no. think you can. I think, I think we need to. I need. I think we need to take all of these uh, things into consideration to become a healthier person, an individual, therefore a healthier society, community, country, province, everything. So um, no, I think we just need to keep working towards more. We need need to make health and public health, everybody's business, not just the individual's. Um, uh, my own personal individual, uh, in my own provincial, my own personal uh, concern. And that's why I issued a report in 2009 that said public health should be everyone's business. We can't obsess about it. We just have to all act together, uh, you know, across government, across sectors, with academics in order to be able to make an impact on, on health and not just on health care. But, but we have to make it saleable. And so when Doug's our next Minister of Health, um, <laughs> we, we have to allow him to stand up in front of the public and say, you know what, for your benefit, and this isn't what's going to help you next year, it's going to help you for the rest of your life, we're investing this amount of money. And, and we have to give him a marketing plan for marketing prevention. Because it's easy to say, I've hired 50 new doctors and we're putting all these new drugs out there because we know you're getting a whole lot sicker because you're just not staying healthy. Um, and that's a, a pretty easy sell, but I think to, to say, I'm really going to help you stay healthier. I'm going to help your kids stay healthier. We have to really develop a, almost a marketing strategy around that. Okay, future Minister of Health, uh, what do you think? Well, you, you, you asked, um, are we going to be in danger of talking about health too much? Well, you know, what we're talking about mostly in the news is, is that cure system. So if we had, a, we had a shift to talk more about prevention, you know, we could have an overall reduction in less, talking less, but just more, more about, um, uh, about prevention. But I think it can be framed too. I think when we talk about prevention, we're just talking about living well um, and uh, a healthy lifestyle. And uh, it's, a center of, it's a central part of, of life, you know, of, of, of what we all want. Um, so I don't think we need to talk about badgering people to, uh, to, uh, to have a healthy lifestyle. I think we just need to have a great discussion about how to live well. And I think we need to personalize this a little bit too, because if current trends continue, the current generation of children will have a lower life expectancy than their parents. That's a pretty sobering observation that has been made uh, by researchers. And we need to take that to heart and think about our children and our grandchildren and what their life is going to be like. So okay. we must make the shift. Doug said it's good to have great discussions. This one was a great one. Thanks, everybody. Thank Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Carol Morley, Director of the Board at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. And Emmanuel Burns, the Canada Research Chair in International Health at the University of Toronto's Dalla Lana School of Public Health. David Sparling is the Chair of Agri-Food Innovation and Regulation at Western's Richard Ivey School of Business. Doug Manuel, senior scientist at the Ottawa Health Research Institute, and Arlene King is Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much.